In 1995, approximately 160 groups left Britain on subsidised visits to Brussels and Strasbourg. Their motives varied, as did their mode of transport, but most planned to meet their European Member of Parliament and to find out more about the workings of the European Union. From Sheffield, Labour's Euro office had organised a four-day coach and ferry trip to Strasbourg. Primarily, they wanted to see the European Parliament in action and to meet Roger Barton, the local MEP. They were to stop off in Reims en route and a grand celebratory dinner was promised for the last night. From Surrey, the European Constituency Conservative Council was running a two-day conference in Brussels. Their main concern was with European defence and security, but a guided walk around Europe's administrative heart and a visit to the new £1 billion Brussels Parliament building was also scheduled. <laughs> Some MEPs encourage these official visits, others are more coy about them. Party activists and Europhiles seem particularly welcome, but anyone can apply for a place. The two groups could hardly have been more politically diverse, but they had startlingly similar things to say about Europe. One of Europe's main claims to fame, one of the European community's main claims to fame, is that really it has helped uh, a, what was at times a very troubled continent. It was after the horrendous battles of the First World War and again the Second World War that both statesmen and economists took a decision that we haven't got to have that sort of Europe again. Well, I think if you look back over our history of this century and you take into account the wars that we've had over division, then of course coming together must be a common sense and a right way forward. I think it's important, particularly from a trading point of view. I think there's lots of benefits that the European countries have that we don't, namely pensions. So I think if we're going into Europe, let's get the good, the good part, as well as any other. Within the continent of Europe, we are, um, we are major trading partners, but we always have been. Uh, and the, uh, the European Community, the European Union, as it now is, is, has actually helped in that process. I think it must, be, it must be good for the country in terms of trade and being attached to such a large market. I am dead against the concept of um, a federal state of Europe. I am very much in favour of nation states within a European framework. Well, uh, clearly, uh, each individual member state wants to retain its own identity. I think if, uh, if unification is forced, then it's not a long-term solution. Eventually, you know, the centrifugal forces blow the whole thing apart again. I don't like the idea of us of being on and not uh, being individual. I think there's certain things in this country that are peculiar to us that I think we should retain. It all boils down to some pretty fundamental fears. Well, in, in Great Britain, there's the worry about monetary union, there's the worry about going further than we want to go, there's the worry about Europe taking us over. There's the worry about loss of sovereignty. Um, those are the issues that worry the people in Great Britain, I think. Can I disturb your, uh, your contemplation of the beautiful views of the uh, French region of the European Union through which we're now passing? Tom Spencer, um, MEP for Surrey, was travelling with the group. Um, one is just to take you through the uh, the programme that you've got in the pack, where heading off to NATO, 
Um, I shall be bi-locating at various moments during this uh, conference. But the practical realities of frontierless travel within Europe were quick to disrupt conservative plans. The park is not just five years out of date, it's sort of in a pre-war sort of thing. Yeah, um, one down. We hope not. And some sort of euro cash would also have been useful. Labour's pace was slower and more contemplative. It had to be. There's over a thousand kilometres of road between Sheffield and Strasbourg. And on the continent, at least, coaches are strictly limited to 90 kilometres or 56 miles an hour. We're starting with the, uh, with the briefing in NATO, uh, both from the NATO staff themselves and from the, uh, uh, and from the British uh, delegation to NATO. present climate of insularity in Washington that the US would ever leave. And then, the, uh, and then a briefing which no one's attempted before, apparently, from the, uh, from the Western European Union. Very much have to see how the, the present Republican leadership in Washington reacts. So that should provide us with a lot of the kind of core building blocks as to where the argument is on defence. ...to become full members of the WVU. But at the end of a long day, not everyone was there to be counted. Where is he? Oh, shit, he's not gone again, is he? He's not in front, he wasn't in front of us, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, dear. Why aren't you at the main gate where oh, he is? Oh, on the coach tabs. He's at the main gate. Because he's not, I suppose he thought for some reason that because he came to the main gate and had to walk, he had to walk back. So. Okay, sorry. Two, two, one is Bachelors, Chris and Jackie. Hello, Are you sorry? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 108. Floor, are you in? In Reims, Labour was well on schedule and had time to explore the night. It's a shame that Euro Anything provokes such a snore. The European Union, encompassing 370 million people in 15 different countries, is now the world's largest trading bloc. And is one area where Europe is setting a pace that the Americas and even East Asia are struggling to keep up with. And I'm extremely grateful to John Stevens, who's the member for the Thames Valley. The next morning, the Conservative colleagues gathered immediately after breakfast in the bar of the Hotel Euro flat. The world economy could shift from being essentially an Atlantic one to a Pacific one. And that is bad news. The speaker was the MEP John Stevens, British Conservative spokesman on foreign affairs and defence. The fact is that it's the prosperity of this time zone that matters. Now, what are the foreign policy implications of those two points? Well, the first one is the US is looking much more at the Pacific. And the, the task of maintaining an Atlantic economy a successful economy in Western Europe, a free trading Western Europe, is a task that has got to be pursued independently of links with the United States. By the year 2016, the Chinese economy is going to be the biggest economy in the world on present growth rates. It'll be bigger than the United States. It and for the vintage champagne, you only drink wines from one good year. So let's say that the quality of the non-vintage champagne is about 90, 95 percent. Fortuitously, the champagne centre of the universe, Labour was grappling with the complexities too. Jeroboam, four times the bottle. Matusalem, eight times the bottle. Salmanasar, 12 times the bottle. 
It was a welcome break from the road, but the tasting was limited to a pretty mean one-third of a glass per head. Not much was carried away. Well, it's pleasant, but uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to, um, you know, be purchasing it at the prices they're asking for here. That doesn't mean to say that, um, you know, it isn't a pleasant product, it is. Well, for the people here, it's an excursion into another world. In Brussels, the Conservatives were off on a whistle-stop, Tom Spencer-led tour of the European Union's built environment. And all the institutions have built themselves buildings that reflect their personality. So the Commission is very 1960s and full of asbestos. The Council's built themselves a huge prison block with mirror glass so that nobody outside can see what's going on inside. And Parliament, as you'll see, has built itself a hugely grandiose glass palace reaching to the sky. In Strasbourg, Labour too found themselves taking the long route to Parliament. This, the official seat of the institution, is a favourite of Labour's, the European Union's only democratically elected body. We had been warned that it was not at its busiest on a Friday morning, but Roger Barton, the Sheffield MEP, was waiting to meet the group. We get it, each one gets a copy. She works at the Euro. Oh, yeah. We are the Nazis. We did a commission of einmal oder hochverehrten Rat. Please request the Council to be considered. Thank you, Mrs. Langenhagen. I call Mr. Martin. Two minutes on behalf of your group. Merci, Madame Thank you. The Parliament was once very much the poor relation of Europe's legislative institutions. Before the 1992 Maastricht Treaty, an opaque college of unelected commissioners initiated all legislation, which was then processed, or not, by a council made up of ministers from the government of each member state. Now, post Maastricht, Parliament has a say in who sits on the Commission, it has the power of veto, and in certain important areas it can make decisions on an equal footing with the Council of Ministers. Attitudes, however, are quite different to those found in British domestic politics. We sit in group blocks, alphabetically. So, in our case, the socialist group is the largest group. We have a large block, and I sit next to a Spaniard on this side and a French person on that side. One thing that you'll find quite astounding here is that we, there isn't the confrontational approach. Because if the parliament is going to use its powers, it's not sufficient just to get a simple majority. You're in a whole different scene here and it's not the combat thing that you get in Westminster. Plenary sessions of the Parliament are held here in Strasbourg for one week each month. And for the rest of the time, in what is probably Europe's most famous and fundamental absurdity, the Parliament and all its staff and paperwork decamps to Brussels, where its specialist committees meet and where most of the politicking with Council and Commission occurs. With almost 100 national political parties squeezed into nine European parliamentary groups, the whole range of Europe's political opinion is represented in the so-called hemicycle. In the glittering new Brussels building, Nearing the end of five years' construction, Tom Spencer took advantage of the lack of parliamentary activity to set up a role play. Dramatic illustration of the fact that the In total, there are now 626 European members of Parliament, of which 87 come from the UK. The largest group, with 221 members and the home of Britain's 62 Labour members, is the Party of European Socialists. The second largest group, 
with 173 members, is the European People's Party, home of Britain's 18 Conservative members. The other obligatory aspect of a subsidised visit to Europe's beefer-catered heart is a briefing from Niall O'Neill of the European Parliament's Visitors Service. As you arrived here this morning, it probably looked and felt as though you were primarily visiting a large building site. Indeed, part of it still is a large building site. This area of Brussels incorporates the buildings of the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council of Ministers, the Blessed Trinity of the European Union. <laughs> and much like the Blessed Trinity, it is an entire mystery to most people how it operates. <laughs> most of us feel comfortable with what happens locally. You know what your local authority should be doing. You know what Westminster should be doing. But when it comes to Europe, it's a bit different. It's further away, the terms are different. Commission, Parliament and Council. The blessed trinity of the European Union. The Commission is like a civil service. But in Britain, like in Germany and France, the civil service is meant to do what politicians tell them to do. The level of the European Union it was felt, in the early years particularly, if you had to wait for unanimous decisions amongst the council as to what they should do <coughs> before they'd ask the commission to do it, you get nowhere. So in a revolutionary departure, they said to the commission, you can present proposals. Parliament's objective is to try and have the draft legislation amended or to have the council and commission take on board our views on certain issues. The system, as designed, does not allow us to instruct the Commission, nor to order the Council to do things. It is based on a system of checks and balances. It means that one has to pull the levers at one's disposition to get across your particular view. We are sometimes concerned about how much democratic control there are over ministers coming out. How accountable <coughs> are they to their own <coughs> parliaments? And if their parliament does not want something, and that minister is outvoted in Brussels, which is quite possible, and in some cases desirable, you nevertheless have a decision, but that national parliament is lost out. We're saying you've got to have a democratic element somewhere, so balance it with the European parliament. And every now and again there's a fundamental discussion about should we be on the path and how should we be progressing. We had the single European Act in the 1980s, we had the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, and now next year we will have Son of Maastricht. The nightmare returns. <laughs> the host MEPs usually also take the opportunity to introduce a few of their colleagues. Ian White, who's from the Bristol area, our, our uh, person in the southwest. Ian, over to yourself, sir. A comrade at the back mentioned about European Parliament's powers of initiative, perhaps not in those terms. But I came along specifically to talk to you about toxic shock and tampons because it's an issue which illustrates... Uh, that very point, and in which I've been deeply involved, and as has the trade union and labour movement in the UK. Now, uh, prior to the Maastricht Treaty, we had what was an unofficial right to propose legislation. It wasn't in the treaty, therefore you had to do it, as Niall has said, in this roundabout way of negotiating and so on. We have, since the Maastricht Treaty, under Article 138, a power to propose legislation. James has been the member <coughs> since 1984. Uh, is the budget spokesman, or the leads for us on the budget, of, as uh, for the British Conservatives, for the British section of the EPP. And that they've now managed to collect in most of the weaponry that was uh, available in that country. And uh, although we've frozen sales for the future, uh, unfortunately there are a very large amount of arms actually on the sea at this moment. These people are desperately trying to develop nuclear weapons at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the canteen, the trunks, which are part of the limousine of being forced to operate in both here and in Strasbourg. So at the end, of, we're here for the three weeks, as you will have now. For both groups, the value of the visit was undoubtedly that it helped to make Europe's abstractions real. Tremendously helpful actually to, to put it all into context and, and actually being in the building uh, does, does, does help. 
that question. Well, I think it's very impressive, and obviously the scope for enlargement uh, is a very sensible thing to put into the operation right from this word go. I've always been a keen European, and having been to Strasbourg in the very, very early days, uh, I've always been especially interested to come to the new parliament building. I think that we have to be in Europe. There's no, there's no way that we can survive. Uh, unless we are in Europe, and the only way we can get things the way, perhaps not necessarily all our own way, but the way we would like to see things moving uh, in progression is for us to be there, and help, helping to alter the legislation. But what t really took me attention more than anything, the two debates we heard, the uh, fishing and the uh, peaches, 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 and, peaches. and they asking for more subsidies towards, to me, more and more agriculture policy policies that are the money they get and they're still asking for more. It wants coming down, not all. It's brought it to mind that we're in Europe and whichever way we've come in, whether you're sceptical, whether you're not sceptic, we're in there and we've got to we've got to make it function and we've got to make it work. So this is a, an exercise in bilocation. Um, it's two dinners Spencer strikes again, except on this occasion I can't make the time two days achieve nothing else, I hope they'll actually equip us all to contribute to the continuing debate in the party as to exactly how we handle the next three or four years. <laughs> well, I suppose I'm naturally against it, I suppose, but I mean, I see it as it is vital to the future of Britain. We do have to get involved. You can't, like, stand back. Oh, yeah, well, look, so much. I've not seen... I've not seen how it works at all before, so long do you laugh? Yeah, I've learned a lot. It's well worth it. I'm getting it sorted out in my mind. I've now got to work it out as to how I'm going to get over the message to the electorate because it's very complicated. It's not a simple issue. I mean, I, when, I, when I first came, I said, well, it was mixed. I've got clear vision now. Yeah, we definitely need Europe. I voted against going into the European Union because I didn't think we were ready to go in economically. But now that we're in, we've got to go the whole hog, I think. I mean, the debate was just people stating their positions, clearly. I mean, it wasn't a debate. I mean, nobody was going to change anybody's mind, so I, g I gave up about halfway through on that. Much more relevance, I think, than a lot of people would, um, would really appreciate. So I actually enjoyed that. in your party? Uh, read some history, uh, look at the facts and grow up. Not necessarily in that order. And to the doubters, Roger. It's a long time since we fought a major war in Europe and there is a danger that people might forget that. You've been getting us all week, I'll get you too. <laughs> Thank you.